Frontier in Space is the third serial of the tenth season of the British science fiction television series Doctor Who. The serial was first broadcast in six weekly parts on BBC One from 24 February to 31 March 1973. It was the last serial to feature Roger Delgado in the role of the Master. The serial is set on the Earth, the Moon, Draconia, and the home planet of the Ogrons in the 26th century. In the serial, the Daleks employ the Master to provoke a war between the humans and the Draconians' galactic empires. Plot As the Earth cargo ship C-982 moves through hyperspace, it narrowly avoids a collision with the TARDIS. As the Third Doctor determines that they are in the 26th century, Joe sees a ship come alongside. Before her eyes, the ship shimmers, changing shape, turning into a draconian galaxy-class battlecruiser. The two pilots, Stuart and Hardy, send out a distress signal and prepare for battle. When Hardy goes to get weapons, he meets the Doctor, but sees him and Joe as draconians. Hardy escorts them at gunpoint to the ship. On Earth, the President and the Draconian Ambassador who is also the Emperor's son accuse each other of attacking the other's ships and violating the frontier established by treaty between the two empires. General Williams reports to the President that a mission to rescue C-982 is being prepared. Williams's hostility against the Draconians is well known. It was his actions that started the original war between the two sides and the Prince believes Williams wants war again, a war the Prince warns the President that will see Earth destroyed. News of the attack spreads and anti-Draconian riots break out on Earth, with the opposition calling for the government to take action. Locked up in C-982's hold, the doctor deduces that the strange sound was some kind of sonic hypnosis device that caused Hardy to hallucinate and see what he most feared. As the enemy boarding party burns its way through the airlocks, Hardy gets the doctor and Joe to use as hostages, but when the airlock door bursts open, the boarders are not draconians, but ogrons. The Ogren's energy weapons stun the two pilots and the Doctor. They then tie Joe up, taking the ship's cargo and the TARDIS as they leave. When the Doctor revives and releases Joe, she tells him what the Ogrons did, and wonders if they are working for the Daleks, as they were when she first met them. The Doctor points out, however, that the Ogrons are mercenaries. When the rescue party arrives, Hardy and Stuart have stopped hallucinating, but with their memories garbled, accuse the Doctor and Joe of being draconian spies. The two travelers get locked up again as C-982 heads back to Earth. General Williams believes they are human agents planted by the draconians to sabotage any war effort by Earth. He brings the two travelers to confront the Draconian Prince, but the Doctor denies working for the Draconians. He tries to convince the President that a third party is trying to provoke the two empires into war. However, as he can provide no reason why someone would want to, Williams orders the Doctor and Joe be taken away and vows he will get the truth out of them. In the Draconian Embassy, the Prince arranges to help Joe and the Doctor escape, so that they can be questioned. When the two are escorted from their cell to be brought to the President, a Draconian squad attacks, taking the Doctor prisoner. When Joe tries to get more guards to help, she is arrested instead. The Draconians question the Doctor, believing that he is involved in a plot with Williams to provoke a new war. The Doctor manages to escape the embassy, but is recaptured in the compound by Earth troops. 
Once back in the cell with Joe, however, she hears the same sound as on C-982. Outside, the Ogrons raid the prison, being seen as draconians thanks to the hypnosound. They break into the doctor's cell and order him to go with them. The second escape goes no better than the first, the doctor is recaptured yet again and the Ogrons disappear. This second, "'rescue attempt' cements Williams' suspicions, making him demand that the President give him the authority to strike first against the Draconians. The President agrees to break off diplomatic relations but will not go further without conclusive proof. Williams places the doctor under a mind probe, but it indicates the doctor is telling the truth. Refusing to believe it, Williams orders increased power, but eventually the probe overloads. The president orders that the doctor be sent to the lunar penal colony where political prisoners are exiled for life, while Joe remains on Earth. Williams and the President receive records from the Dominion government of Sirius IV, an Earth colony planet that has achieved a degree of autonomy from Earth. The records prove the Doctor and Joe are citizens of Sirius IV as well as career criminals. A commissioner from the Dominion has arrived to claim jurisdiction who is in actuality the Doctor's old enemy, the Master. On the moon, the doctor meets Professor Dale of the Peace Party, who shows him around. The doctor tries to get Dale to trust him and include him in his plans for escape. On Earth, Joe of course recognizes the master immediately, and surmises correctly that he was behind the Ogren attacks. The master found out about the doctor and Joe's presence when the Ogrons brought him the TARDIS. Given the unsavory choice of going with the master or staying in her cell, Joe agrees to go with him to fetch the doctor. Despite his fantastic story, Dale believes the doctor. The peace with the Draconians lasted many years, but suddenly devolved into senseless acts of hostility. The doctor's story would explain a great deal. Dale outlines the escape plan. Cross, one of the overseers, will leave two spacesuits near an airlock, and they will walk across the lunar surface to steal a spaceship. Dale offers to take the doctor back to Earth where he can tell his story to Dale's contacts in the press and government. However, once inside the airlock, they find oxygen tanks for the suits are empty. Cross has double-crossed them, and the room is depressurizing. At the last moment, the Master arrives and restores the room's atmosphere. The Master obtains custody of the Doctor, and gets the Doctor to come along quietly by revealing that he has Joe. Reunited with Joe in a cell in the Master's ship, the Doctor wonders why he is still alive. The Master explains that his employers are very interested in the Doctor. The Master sets the automatic controls for the Ogren homeworld. Under the cover of telling Joe stories of his life, the Doctor uses a hidden steel wire to file his way through the hinges of the cell. While Joe blocks the security camera and natters on, pretending to continue their conversation, the Doctor sneaks out. Donning a spacesuit, the doctor exits the ship and makes his way to the flight deck. The master puts Joe in an airlock, threatening to eject her into space if the doctor does not surrender, but the doctor takes him by surprise. As the two face off, they do not notice a draconian battlecruiser approaching. It docks, and enters the airlock where Joe is located. The Draconian captain informs them that, as all diplomatic relations with Earth have been severed, violating Draconian space is punishable by death. The Doctor says he has vital evidence for the Emperor and asks to speak to him. The captain decides to lock up all three of them and take them back to Draconia. 
However, the master secretly activates a device whose signal is picked up by the Ogrons. As the ship arrives on Draconia, the prince is speaking with his father, asking him for permission to strike first at Earth. The emperor, like the president, is hesitant, as he knows such a war could bring down both empires. The doctor, Joe and the master are presented to the emperor and the doctor gives the ritual greeting, my life at your command. The prince is incensed that the doctor has the temerity to address the emperor like a draconian noble, but the doctor says that he is a noble of Draconia. The title was given him by the 15th emperor, five centuries before when he aided Draconia against a plague from outer space. The doctor accuses the master of trying to instigate a war between Earth and Draconia using Ogrons and the Hypnosound device. As the Emperor considers this, a courtier announces that an Earth spaceship has arrived. Joe hears the sound of the sonic device, and realizes it is the Ogrons. They burst in, guns blazing, and retreat with the master, leaving several dead draconians in their wake. One Ogren has been knocked out by the doctor, and as the effects of the hypnosound fade, the emperor sees the Earthman before him transform into its true form. He then realizes the doctor is speaking the truth. The Emperor determines that the Ogren must be shown to the Earth authorities, but as a draconian ship would be shot down, the Prince, the Doctor and Joe will take the Master's police ship. As they cross the frontier into Earth space, they spot another ship following them. However, by the time they identify it as the Ogren ship, it has already launched its missiles. As the doctor takes evasive action, the captive Ogren breaks out of its cell, overpowering its draconian guard. It enters the flight deck and in the struggle cuts the ship's speed. The prince and the doctor subdue the Ogren, but the master's ship catches up and a party boards the police ship. A firefight breaks out on the flight deck, just as an Earth battlecruiser shows up. The master recalls the boarding party, who take Joe captive along with rescuing the Ogren prisoner, and their ship zips away. The Earth battler cruiser places the doctor's ship under arrest. Without the Ogren, the president is not convinced. The doctor suggests an expedition to the Ogren homeworld, but Williams thinks it is a draconian trick to divide Earth's forces. The prince expects such a response from Williams. After all, he started the first war. Williams protests, but the prince reveals what is in the draconian court records. Twenty years before, the draconians sent a battlecruiser to meet the Earth Empire on a diplomatic mission. When the draconian ship did not answer the Earth ship's hails, Williams gave the order to attack, believing that the draconian ship was about to attack his damaged vessel. The battlecruiser was unarmed, its missile banks empty, and the reason it did not answer was because its communications systems were destroyed in a neutron storm, the same storm that had damaged Williams's ship. Williams is shaken by the prince's revelation and apologizes for the wrong he had done to the draconians. Williams now intends to lead the expedition to the Ogren planet himself. The master brings Joe to a bunker on the Ogren homeworld, where he shows her the TARDIS, which he plans to use as bait for the doctor in addition to Joe herself. He tries to hypnotize Joe, first with his own powers and then with the hypnosound. However, Joe's mind is strong enough to resist, and the master orders her to be taken away. An Ogren reports that one of their ships found and attacked two Earth cargo ships, destroying one. The master is delighted, as this means that war is not far off, and indeed, demands for war from Earth are at a fever pitch. 
Williams prepares his personal scout ship, with the Doctor and the Prince accompanying and heads at maximum speed to the coordinates the Doctor took from the Master's ship. Jo manages to dig her way into the next, unlocked cell and sneak further into the bunker as Williams's ship enters orbit. She pockets the hypnosound, then finds a pad with the coordinates of the planet and bunker on it and transmits a distress signal with the information. The master shows up, revealing that the signal was muted, and the only person who could have picked it up was the doctor, whose ship he detected in orbit around the planet. When the doctor comes, the trap will be sprung. Williams's crew lands the scout nearby, not knowing the Ogrons have set up an ambush. The Ogrons open fire on the landing party, but are frightened away by an orange, slug-like lizard they call the Eater. The Master is furious, and warns the Ogrons that their masters are coming, which makes them even more terrified than they were of the monster. Williams's party hears the roar of a spaceship landing, and when they look up on the ridge, they see the Master, accompanied by several Daleks, who exterminate Williams's men before they can even fire. The Daleks want to exterminate the Doctor immediately, but the Master proposes that the Doctor be placed in his hands, to be allowed to see the galaxy and Earth in ruins before they kill him. The Gold Dalek agrees, and leaves for its ship, to go and prepare the Dalek army on another planet. Answering the Prince's question, the Doctor explains that the Daleks want a war between Earth and Draconia so both empires will destroy each other, and then the Daleks can pick up the pieces. The Doctor modifies the stolen hypnosound, making the Ogren guard see him as the gold Dalek, and in fear, it unlocks the gate to the cell. The Doctor tells Williams and the Prince to get the word back to their respective governments and mount a joint expedition against the base on the Ogren planet. The Doctor and Joe find their way to the TARDIS, but are surrounded by the Ogrons and the Master, who trains a blaster on the Doctor. The Doctor activates the hypnosound, panicking the Ogrons. One knocks the Master's arm, making him fire, the shot grazing the Doctor's head. The Master and the Ogrons scatter. The Doctor, barely conscious, asks Joe to help him into the TARDIS. He staggers over to the console, dematerializing the ship then pressing his palms to the telepathic circuits. He is sending a message to the Time Lords. Topic production The titles for Frontier in Space were prepared, like Carnival of Monsters, with a new arrangement of the theme music performed by Patty Kingsland on a synthesizer. Known as the Delaware Arrangement, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop was based on Delaware Road in West London. It proved unpopular with BBC executives, so the original Delia Derbyshire theme was restored, although an early edit of Episode 5 still contains the Delaware music and was used for the VHS release. The final sequence in the Master's headquarters was intended to contain the giant Ogren eating monster, but director Paul Bernard did not like the costume and omitted it, leaving the scene with just frightened Ogrons running away from something unseen. Producer Barry Letts and script editor Terence Dix felt the sequence lacked impact and a new ending was filmed in the TARDIS as part of the first production block of the following story, Planet of the Daleks. Frontier in Space was Paul Bernard's last Doctor Who work. When the wiping of episodes ended in 1978 it was discovered that episodes 1, 2, 3 and 6 had only survived as black and white telerecordings for overseas sales. In the mid-1980s PAL copies were returned from broadcasters in Australia. <laughs> Cast notes
This would be the last appearance of Roger Delgado as the master, his final scene being the confusion outside the TARDIS with his shooting the Doctor, perhaps accidentally, then disappearing with the panicking Ogrons. Roger Delgado was killed in a car crash in Turkey less than three months after this episode's UK broadcast. John Woodnut had previously played Hibbert in Spearhead from Space 1970 and would later play the dual roles of Broughton and the Duke of Forgal in Terror of the Zygons 1975 as well as Surin in The Keeper of Traken 1981. Luan Peters had previously appeared in The Macra Terror 1967 under her stage name Carol Keyes. Caroline Hunt previously appeared in The Reign of Terror 1964. A caption slide from the end credits of Episode 1 was reused accidentally for Episode 2. This resulted in Lawrence Davison Draconian First Secretary and Timothy Craven cell guard not being credited on screen, though they were billed in Radio Times, and Louis Mahoney newscaster and Roy Pattison Draconian Space Pilot both of whom appeared only in Episode 1, being repeated. <laughs> Broadcast and reception Paul Cornell, Martin Day, and Keith Topping wrote of the serial in the Discontinuity Guide 1995, "...worthy, very well directed and designed to the hilt with a solid costuming policy for both empires. However, it's obviously padded in parts." In the Television Companion 1998, David J. Howe and Stephen James Walker stated that the story worked «brilliantly» with the production design, «putting the whole thing on a suitably grand scale». According to the BBC's audience research report, Frontier in Space was well received by viewers at the time of broadcast. In 2010, Patrick Mulkern of Radio Times recalled that it was "...surprising and exciting," on first reviewing, though in retrospect it seemed to be "...a lumbering wannabe epic with screeds of padding, duff cliffhangers and endless scenes of the Doctor and Joe banged up." He praised the Draconians and Ogrons, but felt that the fact that the heroes spend perhaps two-thirds of the story locked up is tiresome and cannot be overlooked." DVD Talks John Sinnott noted that the story was, "...talky," and had a lot of padding, but that it got, "...much better," when the master was revealed. <laughs> Commercial releases. In print A novelization of this serial, written by Malcolm Hulkey, was published by Target Books in September 1976 under the title Doctor Who and the Space War. This was the last time Target would give a novelization a substantially different title than that of the serial on which it was based. The novel abandons the cliffhanger ending of the televised program and has the Doctor simply leaving the Master on the Ogren world to pursue the Daleks. An unabridged reading of the novelization by actor Jeffrey Beavers was released on CD in February 2008 by BBC Audiobooks. Topic: <laughs> Home Media. The story was released on VHS in August 1995. Episode 5 uses the Delaware music mentioned above. The final episode of this story was also issued on the Pertwee Years VHS release, along with the final episodes of both Inferno and The Demons 
The serial was released on 5 October 2009 as part of the box set, Dalek War, alongside Planet of the Daleks. <laughs>